Fascia Research Society invites ABMP podcast listeners to attend the 6th International Fascia Research Congress, September 10th through 14th, 2022 in Montreal. The event includes eight keynote speakers, over 60 parallel session talks and posters, seven full and eight half-day workshops, and a two-day fascia-focused dissection workshop. The lineup of keynote speakers and workshops is already available on the Fascia Research Society website, and the full Congress schedule will be out June 3rd. Register for the 6th International Fascia Research Congress today at fasciaresearchsociety.org. Easily run your business with free online scheduling, payment processing, and more from the new ABMP Pocket Suite Signature Edition. ABMP has partnered with Pocket Suite to bring members a free, easy to use phone app that lets you focus on what matters most your clients. Businesses on Pocket Suite see an average 30% increase in earnings, and you can get set up in 15 minutes by choosing from curated, preloaded settings or customizing the app for your practice. Features include online scheduling. HIPAA compliant intake forms and contracts, and payment processing, all included in the ABMP Signature Edition and all free to ABMP members. Go to abmp.com slash pocket suite to get started and spend more time focusing on what you love. I'm Darren Buford. And I'm Kristen Coverley. And welcome to the ABMP podcast, a podcast where we speak with the massage and body work profession. Our guest today is David Lasondak. David is the author of the international bestseller, Fascia, What It Is and Why It Matters, currently in nine languages. His follow-up book as editor, Fascia, Function and Medical Applications, was nominated for a 2021 British Medical Association Award. In addition to the contributing chapters to numerous other publications, he hosts the podcast Body Talk with David Lasondak. Besides that, I would also be remiss after reviewing his background to not also mention he has some interesting things like being a DJ and involved in the funeral arts, which I'm sure we'll ask about in just a second. Learn more about David at davidlasondak.com. Hello, David. Hello, Kristen. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me on. This is great. David, we're so excited to have you here. And as Darren said, he really did have to shorten that bio. We have a lot of really fascinating things in your background. Um, One of them is talking about being a fascial fitness trainer. And that was a new category for us. That was a new phrase for us. What does that mean? Okay. Well, that's a long story. But for a number of years, I was involved with a group of people in Germany, including uh, Robert Schleip and Devo Muller, uh, P.J. O'Claire over here in the States. And they were taking uh, the scientific concepts that we were promulgating in the various uh, fascia congresses and saying, how do we specifically apply these principles to sports and movement? And what would that look like as opposed to body work and rehabilitation scenarios? So I got very involved with that group in Germany over the years. Uh, there have been a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, R&D, a lot of trial and error if if I can be quite frank, uh, in terms of finding what worked, what didn't work, what was too much, what wasn't enough in terms of application. And I believe now the fascial fitness as as a brand or a thing to learn to be certified in is available through the Fascia Training Academy, and I'm blanking on the gentleman's name who runs that. Uh, but yes, I was I was very involved with that for years. It's four core principles. I don't, I never turned it. It was like when I got my yoga teacher training. I didn't want to be a yoga teacher, but I wanted to have that knowledge base more solid uh, to inform my day job. And it was the same thing with the fascial fitness training. It's like, well, where am I going to go with this? And I use it a lot in when I'm giving my patients homework and such. Is that a situation where you would complete the 10 sessions of rolfing or structural integration, and then you would work with that same practitioner, or you would then move to a different practitioner who is probably specifically trained as that? Um, well, no, the, the idea behind fascial fitness was that once or twice a week, you would go to a fascial fitness class that incorporates uh, the principles of elastic recoil, 
uh, incorporates the aspect of sensory awareness, uh, incorporates the aspects of uh, rehydration, preparatory counter movements, softness. You, you don't want to be a bull, you want to be a panther. Uh, and then there were also applications to whatever it is that you normally do for your fitness. So let's say I'm a gym rat and I'm going to do lat pull downs. I think we all know lat pull downs. So every say third time I'm in the gym doing my lat pull downs, I would add a fascial component. So I would lighten the load so I could get more of a bouncing action going, get a little recall going. And then I would actually turn slowly to the left and turn slowly to the right and work in vectors so that I'm training in all the possible angles. And the idea behind fascial fitness is that this is a this is a longer term project. This is something that you're going to notice results from three, six, nine months, twelve months down the road gradually, uh, and it's going to give you more resilience. And and that was part of it too. So what we realized is people who were actually doing these classes every day um, wasn't such a good thing for the instructors <laughs> because they were over training their fascial system and actually engendering a lot of inflammatory states. So when I say there was a lot of R and D that was part of it, but I still use, I still use some of those ideas, uh, to help my clients and patients, uh, in my practice. So uh, that's just how I've chosen to incorporate it. I love that. And I also love thinking about fascia in that way. So activities of daily living, things we're already doing, but bringing a fascial awareness to our movement or to our practice. And that's a lot about what you talk about with fascia, right? Just having an awareness of that it exists and its role in the body. Well, exactly, exactly. And paying attention to what you're doing. Uh, so, you know, you don't wanna be checked out. You don't wanna be checked out watching a video while you're doing your, your exercise. You wanna be feeling what you're feeling. And there's that tendency also, uh, again, I'm, I'm just talking specifically about weight lifting kind of things here, because that's just the thing I picked. We could apply this. And we did this great, we worked out this great sun salutation sequence with mini bounces and all these other elastic recoil, very different from the more traditional yoga one. But there's that tendency in weightlifting, like you go really boom, and then you kind of sink, like you kind of like you give your effort in the last one. And then while you're resting before your next set, you kind of collapse in on yourself and go like, nah, that's not, that's not a very fascial principle. We want you to be kind of sitting upright and kind of being like, okay, I'm just going to sit here and feel what I'm feeling and where I'm feeling it and just go, oh, that's interesting. So, so there, that was an important component of it too, but even in day-to-day -day life. So, you know, if you have, uh, switch plates, uh, in your house that aren't the, the little levers, but the little kick plates as they call them, use your foot. When you, you want to turn on the light, turn it on with your foot, you know, little things like that throughout the day. It's great too. Uh, if you're in an, a building with an elevator and there's other people there, you kind of reach out with your foot, you know, <laughs> and they look at you and you're like, I'm 60, deal with it. <laughs> David, where did you catch the fascia bug? We talked a little bit, obviously your background is super fascinating and interesting. Where did you actually get fascinated and interested to pursue fascia as a career? Uh, about the year 2000, about the year 2000, uh, I was, it, it's actually, it's a, it's a three prong story, uh, so to speak, but to try to condense it, uh, I had been working at that point for eight years and I was a self-described clinical massage therapist. I had done a lot of trigger point studies and other things. And, you know, my whole objective was let's treat your pain and get you out of pain because I know that this can do it and you can stay there. And we can also do it in a way that engenders a deep relaxation. You don't have to be, you know, chomping at the bit. You, we don't have to give you more pain to get rid of your pain, you know? Um, so that was kind of been my, my channel. And I had developed a pretty good reputation, but at the same time, there were things that weren't adding up. So I could have one person, I could have three people who all have low back pain. And this person, after seven visits, they're doing great. This other person it took 17, this person never got better, you know, or pick any other sort of condition that somebody might come to you for. And so that was like, okay, what, you know, this is, you know, where, where's the missing link to all this? In the meantime, I started developing some of my own repetitive motion issues. Some of my own little chronic aches and pains. And, and then every once in a while, I would be doing a session and the, the tone of it would change, you know, like, cause the, the, the tactile quality of what I was doing, uh, with the body, I always remember a very specific session 
Uh, I was working in the in the rhomboid area up underneath uh, the posterior surface, so they were supine, and and I was like, it, it just felt like I was just you know, pulling apart. The, this would be like nineteen ninety nine, you know, working with the whole shoulder joint and everything, and and it was it was very different from the other kinds of tactile qualities the other techniques that I used like PNF or trigger point or effleurage or any of that and uh, I started doing more and more of that because uh, people really liked it and then sometimes they'd be like could you do that thing you did again uh last time and it wouldn't be as good the second time <laughs> which was a little frustrating for everybody <laughs> yeah. it was like because that was really great last time right because well they got that piece last time there was another piece related to that piece and then I met somebody who did uh, fascial body work. Uh, she was a Heller worker. Uh, she came to work at a location in the same town, nine miles uh, west of Pittsburgh proper that I was in. And I thought, well, I should go find out what she's doing and, and make friends with her. And it was just like, boom. It's like, oh my God, this is what I need for my problem. I think I need to go learn this. And I think sometimes I'm doing this, but I don't know what I'm doing. So I better learn something about it. So it was just all those things happening at once. And once I went there, I'm like, okay, this is what this is what I wanted to be doing all along. It just was obvious to me. And for those listeners who aren't familiar with Heller work, can you tell us a little bit about that, David? So um, you mentioned earlier Rolfing structural integration. Okay, so just as there are different brands of things there are different types of pilates different types of yoga different types of massage approaches some of them have little circle r's after them or circle c's um structural integration is a blanket term like uh tissue paper or hamburger uh but there are different brands underneath that so rolfing is like a big mac uh heller work has this they do 11 sessions they don't do 10 they have more of a dialogue involved a little psycho-emotional approach uh i went to anatomy trains we're a royale with cheese and we have 12 sessions and but it's all hamburger Oh, I'm sorry. I'm laughing out loud at the Royale. With no, you can laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. That was really helpful. I'm sure for someone who's like, wait a minute, what is that modality? And there are yeah. modalities sometimes that aren't as well known. So I love that you did that. I was curious. I thought maybe the funeral director was going to sneak its way into the uh, awareness of fascia story. I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was not. I was not a funeral director. That you have to go to school and get a fancy piece of paper for that. And um, the place I worked for I was like, you want to get it? Fine, but you still got to work full time. And I'm like, no, that doesn't work for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a, no, I, I, uh, I was looking for a job that I could get to by bus that paid better than minimum wage. And there was a eight location funeral home chain in the South Florida area that was looking for the an embalming crew intern. Uh, so all of the bodies were processed in a central location uh, and they were looking for somebody to kind of show up, uh, wear a suit, pick them up in the car, bring them in, take them to the airport because sometimes I got flown to other places for burial, uh, take the medical examiner, take them to the funeral home for the viewing, help dress them. I learned how to do a mean head of hair. There's almost nothing you can't do with an extreme comb over. Um, but I never actually learned any of the embalming techniques or any of that because that was next level uh in terms of uh schooling and certification and all that and i that definitely wasn't a career i wanted to do but i'll tell you the first time that i went into a cadaver lab and i was kind of nervous and i walked in and i saw the bodies and i had the smells i'm like oh hey yeah i know about I'm, I'm good i'm cool so <laughs> i never thought that that experience would come back around in a positive way like over a decade later so that was that was an okay thing all right, David, I'm going to tap into your fascia expert knowledge right now, because a no. lot of times I know therapists are like, I understand that fascia is an important part of the body, that it's one of our tissues that we need to learn and understand about, but why does it matter? Why is it so important? So let's talk about why does fascia matter? Okay, so it's two parts. Fascia responds to supply and demand and use it or lose it is a biological reality. Okay, so let's let's unpack those two statements. Supply and demand. The more I do something, the more my body is going to respond slowly over time to reorganize 
the collagen matrix to support that thing that I'm doing. So let's say for reasons, I decide I want to hop on one foot four hours a day over a period of one to three to four months, the structure, the collagenous structure on the leg I'm hopping on is going to change to support that repetitive habit. Likewise, the leg that I've got the knee bent, so it's not hitting the ground at all, is going to reorganize around that constant mechanical input. The cells that build collagen respond to mechanical input, pressure and vibration. So that's going to do a slow remodeling so that I can continue to hop on one foot every day for four hours a day and do so relatively well supported. So let's translate that into somebody who's been in an accident and has had their foot in a boot for three months and everything's fine, but they're not fine. And people are looking at the side that the boot was on and they're not looking at the other side that was having to do the heavy lifting while they were in the boot or somebody who has a change of jobs and maybe is doing a, a very different uh, physical job than the one they used to. So our body is designed to continually to grow and adapt and mold itself to the activities we do on a regular basis. And so that's number one. And number two, use it or lose it is a biological principle. If I don't get up and move enough, my collagen network is going to become highly disorganized. So you can think about it as a garden that never gets weeded. Okay, so without regular mechanical stimulation, Whatever it is, even if it's just going out and going for a walk for 40 minutes a day, the cells that build the collagen aren't getting enough mechanical information to know the right way to maintain the architecture that your body wants. So you know, a big thing about fascia is if you think about it in terms of the body having an architecture, it is the mortar, but it's the living biodynamic mortar in between the bricks of the bones and covering the muscles and the organs and so on and so forth. And that's why it matters. And we can change it. We can change it. We can engender a change and keep it going in the direction of restoration rather than deterioration. Let's take a short break to hear a word from our sponsors. Anatomy Trains is delighted to invite you to our in-person fascial dissection workshop, May 30th through June 3rd, 2022. We're excited to be back in the lab with Anatomy Trains author Tom Myers and master dissector Todd Garcia in Todd's Laboratory of Anatomical Enlightenment in Boulder, Colorado. Join students from around the world and from all types of manual, movement, and fitness professions to explore the real human form, not the images you get from books. Visit anatomytrains.com for details. Now let's get back to the podcast. Now, is that change that you're helping to implement permanent or is that something that it's a continuous process? It can be permanent, um, permanent being a relative state. So ideally, uh, whenever I have somebody new that I see for the first time, I tell them that my job is to put myself out of a job. So um, I want you to come in because you... <laughs> want to not because you have to so if if i'm doing my work correctly if i'm engaging and i work at a hospital so i'll use the word patient it just comes out that way um if i'm engaging with my patient correctly making sure that i'm helping to build their proprioceptive awareness not just oh hey i feel better and there's nothing wrong with feeling better don't don't take that personally anybody um and i give them simple things so I usually give people a one physical homework, which could be a very simple stretch um, that, that has a traction or more fascial component to it to help maintain whatever good result we got in that session was. And then I usually give them an awareness homework, a little bit of Zen homework, you know? So it's like, okay, that thing that you're feeling, you're not feeling it now. You know, I'm not great. So the next time you feel it, you know, take a moment and just make a note of what you're doing or how you're doing it. You know, or, um, you know, I, here's a good one. Like, so for people who tend to lock out their knees, hyperextend their knees, uh, their bit of Zen homework, maybe just throughout the day, ask yourself, where are my knees? Oh, you know, no, you know, you, need to, you know, just make it very simple. Just where are my knees? And you begin to get, 
indoctrinate that person, um, guide that person into having a deeper relationship with their own body, which for me is the secret sauce, because then that carries them on when we're done. So it may be that in weekly visits, uh, sometimes bi-weekly visits over a period of, of three to five months, we've reached most of the goals. Now, there are people who, and this is not a value that I was taught in school, but it's one I learned in the field, who may have a more chronic condition that is less, or or their their body itself is more in a more deteriorated state than ideally would I'd like to see. So I've worked on 74-year-olds who, um, I've worked on people who are 44 years old who were more deteriorated than some of the 74-year-olds. So age doesn't matter. It can, but it doesn't. Um, but their regenerative capacity may be a bit less, or they have a very physically demanding job. So think any kind of professional athlete or professional physical performer, they may need more frequent tune-ups because of what they're putting their body through. But most, most people, if you can guide them through it correctly, focus it on addressing their specific needs while you're looking at the overall structure and how everything's relating to everything else, you can achieve a pretty self-sustaining effect over a three to five month period. And then literally I'll say, come back in three months for a checkup. Uh, they come in for a checkup. If everything's fine, it's like, come back in six months. You know, and by then they know, and they can go and they can get their deep tissue massage or their chiropractic or the other things, and they'll get more out of those things because I've done the weeding. So David, I'm curious, you mentioned uh, in, in your description there of working with patients at a hospital. That to me uh, rings differently than thinking about doing a series with people out of your practice. How is that different? Can you tell me a little bit about working in a hospital? Well, my practice is in the hospital. I'm affiliated, uh, I'm an allied health member, as they call it, in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Shady Side Campus. Whew, that's a lot. Shout out. So I work in the Integrative Medicine Center. So I'm the senior structural integrator there. We have uh, someone else we just hired about six months ago who's awesome. We have three acupuncturists, two chiropractors, several people who do EMDR. Uh, psychologists. Uh, we do a fair amount of research and we have an overall medical director who is an MD and also a psychiatrist who kind of writes her over everything. And there's maybe 80 or 90 of these kind of departments affiliated with uh, medical universities or university hospitals. Uh, Gainesville, Florida is another one uh, around University of Maryland, around the country. We do yoga, they do yoga, uh, University of Maryland that is. And it's an incredible opportunity. We also have some massage therapists uh, in our department as well. And so when they opened the door to that, I, I jumped in back in 2008, right about the time the recession happened. Great time for a career change. But I always wanted to be working in the medical environment because I believed uh, and I had seen things that I felt were like, okay, this is, um, this is medicine because this is making the person healthier in the long term. So the integrative medicine movement, along with, the, you can call it mind-body medicine, if you like, uh, it used to be called alternative. It was called complementary for a while. They finally settled on integrative because we want to work uh, with the Western approach as well, because they're not all bad. They don't do everything. We don't do everything. But working together, we can do more. So the, the only way really that it's different, Darren, is that I go into, I go into a different kind of office I have a, a decent sized treatment room with a skylight, which is really nice. I can dress how I want to dress. Uh, we reopened. Here's another way it was different. So after closing down for two months in March and April of 2020, we reopened in May. So I was working straight through the pandemic because we are predominantly 80% uh, in outpatient pain management clinic. We just needed to get the T's crossed and I's dotted to uh, represent as that, but that's the majority of what we do and the kinds of people that we serve. And I'll tell you the other way that's different was when I had this opportunity, I thought, wow, I am going to see some really interesting and really different kinds of patient profiles here. Uh, they're going to throw things at me that I would never maybe get in a private practice. So I, I saw so many, so much potential application for structural integration in other areas of pain management and rehab medicine. So I thought, 
what a great chance to jump in and see what's possible. David, this might be a good time to transition and talk about your newest book that came out in 2021, Fascia, Function, and Medical Applications. This book is a compilation of pieces on the topic of fascia, I believe. How did you become involved with this and why is presenting fascia to this particular medical audience important? So it's a two-part question, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> and I usually have two ideas about everything, so now I got four. Um, all right. Um, so let's let's talk about the book first. I had been asked, uh, due to the popularity of fascia, what it is and why it matters, to contribute uh, a chapter on fascia and fascial dysfunction in a book on physical therapy, uh, metabolic therapies in orthopedics. And the publisher noticed that chapter. Uh, it got some good notices. So they contacted me and said, could you get us a textbook on this stuff? And I thought, well, that's something I've never done before. And a publisher is asking me to create a book. I better say yes. Okay. When somebody asks you to do something you've never done before, but it's up your alley, say yes. You know, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to figure some things out. But uh, to me, that's always an exciting place to be. Let's do something I've never done before. And I thought, well, I can't write this on my own, but certainly I know all the right people who contribute to something like this. And they wanted something specific for the medical and healthcare reader. Now, my first book works fine in that, but this is a little more specific. This is a little more academic-oriented writing because we wanted to create something that any MD could read. And even if they didn't agree with it, could at least say, well, okay, I don't know that I agree with this, but this person knows what they're talking about. They're well-cited, they're well-researched, they're well-reasoned. So I got Carlos Stecco to write the anatomy chapter. I asked Antonio Stecco to write the physiology chapter. I asked Robert Schleip to write the nervous system chapter. So it was really great to kind of go to the, the best people I could think of in each of these situations and say, could you give me 5,000 or so words uh, on this topic and kind of just ride herd over the whole project. Uh, and my friend, Angeli Aiki, I'm like, could you co-edit this with me? Because I wanted that MD person that I'm not to be able to read through it and go, okay, that works, that, no, that's a little, we need to make, we need to tighten that up. That's not quite working here. Um, so that was important as well. And, and this was really kind of not as unusual uh, in outgrowth as you might think, because in 2013, I managed to give a talk at the first integrative medicine conference and I threw my hat in the ring when they were doing a, when they were doing a confab uh, and they gave me like the 8.30 a.m. last morning slot of death. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, We've all been in that slot, slot, David. <laughs> yeah, but it was a slot. It was a slot, you know. Right, right. And about, I don't know, 14, 16 people showed up, but they were the right 14 or 16 people. That's the, yes. that's the thing too. You know, yeah, we all want to have a couple hundred people, but if the right dozen people show up, that's just as good as a couple hundred people. Um, and, and what I realized is that nobody, even in the integrative medicine world, was talking about this stuff. And every opportunity I had at the hospital to to give a talk on a weekend or go into the lib uh, the medical library and do sitting 101, uh, I was using those opportunities for five years. I met every month with an integrative medicine interest group at the hospital where people would show up from different departments, different modalities, and we'd all just together get together in kibitz, learn from each other. So I was comfortable in that environment. Uh, and I realized that even the people that should know more about this stuff weren't getting it. So maybe that was my job here uh, to help them get it some more. And I'm, I'm very happy with how the book turned out. It came out in the tail end of 2020, horrible time to have something new come out. Uh, but even at that, it's it's pretty, it's, it's, I think it's accessible and it's organized in a sequential way. So, you know, if you, if you go from start to finish, you're going to get a cumulative base of knowledge through this that, that fits together as a whole. And I think that's always been the challenge when you're writing about fascia, uh, when you're putting together a book or a program about it, it, it can be so many things in so many places simultaneously, and it has so many different, if not functions, potential ways it can influence the body. How do you structure it in a way that creates a gestalt uh, for the reader. So that by the time they get to the end of the journey, they can kind of put it together in the body the way it really is in their brain with the knowledge that they have. 
I'm seeing, I, I love the idea that you, you've helped put this book together for as a communication device between these two communities. And you're already working in that community, so which is fascinating. Has the reception and the understanding about fascia outside of our internal bodywork communities continued to grow? It it absolutely has, and and it's continuing to. It's a slow process, and I think that's the the frustrating thing. Uh, there's part of me that's like, okay, I've been doing this for over 20 years now, and you're just getting it. Uh, but if you read the history of science, which I do, uh, the history of medicine, these kinds of sea changes are slow to take hold because you have to you have to find a way around a lot of preconceived ideas. So my first book actually was the outgrowth of an article that I wrote. Uh, I was being pressured very nicely by uh, my mentor at the hospital who was an osteopath and an MD uh, to write. And when I was at that first conference in 2013, uh, somebody approached me from a journal and said, I really liked your lecture. Could you write that up as an article? And I was like, well, I happen to have it right here. Uh, <laughs> and I, I want to make a few tweaks to it. Can I get it to you in a couple of weeks? And I thought, oh my God, I just got my first published paper. Oh my God. And it sat in peer review for nine months because they wound up not using it. They said, could you reformulate it as a scientific hypothesis paper? And I was so burned out at that point. Plus I was starting to work on the book and I kind of said, the book has to take precedence, but, but here's what happened. He gave it to three people. And one person said, wow, this is great. You need to publish this. Everybody else needs to know this. One guy said, I'm not even reading it based on the title. All right. So there's, there's, there's one third of his readership, another third of his readership. And then the other guy they sent it to, or a woman, I don't know, said, this reads like a written down medical lecture. And I thought, well, that's fair because it's a medical lecture that I wrote yeah. down. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so uh, you, you kind of you you found me out there. Um, so I, I'd say things things are improving. And, you know, the, the best thing that, that works is results uh, and curiosity. I think the, you know, if you're getting good, consistent results, people are going to notice. Okay. And, and, and that's going to eventually feed on itself. And I find myself, I talked about interns coming in and hanging out with me for a half hour. Next thing I know, I'm getting a referral from a doctor's office. I don't even know this doctor. Ah, but that person who sat in with me for a half hour for, for an afternoon is working in that office now. And they said, this is the guy you got to go see. Uh, and the other thing is to be curious and to be open to what other people are doing. So I think what tends to happen when we feel like we have a, a highly specialized knowledge that can really make a difference that we're really excited about, we kind of get a full head of steam about making sure that we tell everybody about how awesome this is. And that isn't always the right approach, particularly if you want to move into a more medical stream. Uh, because you're going to be overturning some some long cherished beliefs and myths, but those people don't necessarily look at those as beliefs and myths. Uh, but if you go back and read the history of medicine, read the history of science, uh, it happens all the time. The, the, these turnovers happen, and they take decades, in some cases centuries, uh, to change. And if you show interest in what the other person, if whether it's a surgeon or a chiropractor or whatever, well, how are you doing what you're doing? Okay, wow, that's right. Yeah. Do you ever have any people that you just don't know what to do with? Yeah, you know, sometimes I do. Oh, well, why don't you send those people to me? Maybe I can help those people. If you can be a problem solver as opposed to a, let me tell you about the part you missed. <laughs> let me tell you about the thing I'm bringing that you don't have that's going to be like the best thing ever. You're, you're actually going to do better. And believe me, I am guilty of that too. I've been, I've been at this for three decades. I've made every mistake, some even twice. So, um, you know, the more, the more open you are to being helpful to others, the more that, 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 that pool widens. And, and that's always been the, when I'm writing whatever I'm writing or you know, the second edition of my first book is getting ready to come out in three months. It's like, how can I make this more understandable, more of service and get more people interested, engaged, give them good science, but also, you know, spark their imagination. This has been a fascinating conversation today. I want to thank our guest, David Lasondak. For more information about David, visit David Lasondak. Dot com. Thanks, David. And thanks, Kristen. Thank you so much. I've had a great time and uh, look forward to the next time. 
We are looking forward to the next time already too. Thank you so much, David. Members are loving ABMP 5-Minute Muscles and ABMP Pocket Pathology, two quick reference web apps included with ABMP membership. ABMP 5-Minute Muscles delivers muscle-specific palpation and technique videos, plus origins, insertions, and actions for the 83 muscles most commonly addressed by body workers. ABMP Pocket Pathology, created in conjunction with Ruth Werner, puts key information for nearly 200 common pathologies at your fingertips and provides the knowledge you need to help you make informed treatment decisions. Start learning today. ABMP members log in at abmp.com and look for the links in the featured benefits section of your member homepage. Not a member? Learn about these exciting member benefits at abmp.com 